month's practical chemistry video is looking at the two processes of reflux and distillation. So reflux and distillation come up in all the core practicals for all the exam boards and they are basically methods of heating organic reaction mixtures. So they're going to come up in your organic core practicals or PAGs or CPACs, whatever you want to call them. So before we look at the difference between distillation and reflux, let's look at some of the similarities that we might need to know about, maybe talk about in exam questions. So when we're heating organic liquids, or in fact, usually when we're heating any liquid, we're going to be tending to be using a round or sometimes a pear shaped flask and not, for example, a conical flask. And that is because it spreads the heat more evenly through the reaction mixture. And um, it's very likely that you've used a Bunsen burner in your school chemistry practicals to heat these flasks, but it's not ideal. So the reason that it's not great to use a Bunsen burner, you probably did it because of lack of supply of anything else, Bunsen burner is very hot and the liquids in the container often have quite low boiling points. They don't need to be heated that much. But another is the liquids are usually quite flammable. And so it's much better, therefore, to use an electrical heater to heat our flask instead. We can also control heating a lot better if we use a water bath, especially if we've got very low boiling point compounds. And so in practice, actually, a water bath in chemistry is often just putting a beaker of water around it and putting your flask in there. And then we know that around the flask can't get hotter than the boiling point of water. Then one last important practical detail that is used in both reflux and distillation are anti-bumping granules. So. These are just small glass or ceramic beads, or they may not be round, they just be pieces of ceramic that you add to your flask. They have a very important job. They provide a surface, and this allows smaller bubbles of gas to form than normal. So that might seem like a strange thing because you want your mixture to boil, but you want it to boil in a controlled way. And by allowing more small bubbles to form, it stops big bubbles forming and big bubbles can end up pushing the mixture out of the flask and that is what we call bumping. Let's have a look at distillation. Distillation is used to separate what we call a miscible liquid from another miscible liquid or they're miscible with each other. So miscible means the liquids mix together. So we can't use a separating funnel because they don't form two separate layers like, for example, a haloalkane and an aqueous layer might. So this would look this would be our distillation apparatus in the lab. We've got a condenser which is a glass tube and has a supply of cold water running around the outside of it. Water goes in at the bottom and out at the top. At the top of the apparatus, above the flask, we're going to have a stopper to stop any gases escaping that way. And we're going to have a thermometer. And notice that the end of the thermometer is at the entrance to the condenser. It's not in the liquid. As we heat that liquid mixture, the liquid with the lowest boiling point is going to boil first and so it turns into a gas and those vapors are going to travel up and into the condenser. In the condenser, because of that cold water supply around the outside, the gas will cool down, condenses and we can collect the liquid at the end of the condenser. And the thermometer tells us the boiling point of the substance that is going into the condenser at that time. For example, if our mixture contained both ethanol and water, we could tell that what we are collecting by reading the thermometer because the liquids have different boiling points. Sometimes the boiling points of the liquids we're trying to separate are actually very close together or very similar. And this is when we need to use fractional distillation. So when we do this in the lab, fractional distillation apparatus actually looks really similar to our previous example, 
The only difference is this very tall column, which is often filled with glass beads or has little bumpy bits on it to provide extra surface area. So how does this separate our liquids better? Let's go back to ethanol and water. Ethanol boils at around 78 degrees and water at 100, which is not particularly far apart. So if you think about the fact that we're heating the flask at ethanol's boiling point of 78, there's also a lot of water evaporating too. So both liquids will be turning into a gas, even though one of them is at its boiling point and one is slightly below. So that mixture of vapours of ethanol and water, for example, will start to travel up that glass column. But the higher boiling point substance is going to condense first because it condenses at a higher temperature, whereas the other one will stay a gas at that temperature. So that higher boiling point substance will condense in the column and return to our flask whereas the lower boiling point substance is more likely to reach the top of the column and into the condenser to be collected as a liquid. And you should also be familiar with the use of fractional distillation to separate the fractions in crude oil, but because that's an industrial technique, our fractionating column looks very different, but it's still the same idea of things rising up and condensing at particular points. So when do we use distillation? The main use, as we've already said, is separating a liquid from a mixture. So it's a purification technique. We would use it at the end of a chemical reaction. So let's say that we've heated a primary alcohol with an oxidizing agent and produced a carboxylic acid. Now you've got lots of things in that reaction mixture. You've got carboxylic acid, but you've also got water, you've also got acid, you've got oxidizing agent, you may even have some leftover alcohol. So we can use distillation to separate out the product that we want. And distillation is also used in the oxidation of a primary alcohol to form an aldehyde. In this case, we're not using distillation just as purification, we're actually using distillation to stop the reaction from going any further. So the first stage in oxidation of a primary alcohol is to make an aldehyde. And if we have our setup for distillation while we're doing this, the aldehyde will boil and leave the reaction mixture. It's got a low boiling point. It will go straight into the condenser, so it won't go back into the flask where the oxidizing agent is and therefore cannot be further oxidized, so we won't make the carboxylic acid. OK, let's talk about drawing this apparatus. So you might be asked to draw distillation apparatus in exam question. That might seem a little bit daunting if you've looked at the previous diagrams, but we can keep it really simple. It doesn't have to be a work of art, but there are just some things we need to include and some simple rules. So first of all, we're going to draw a flask that just looks vaguely round. And also we're going to put some liquid in our flask. A surprising number of students forget to put anything inside their flask. Don't bother trying to show the places where different pieces of apparatus connect together or the joins between apparatus. You need to make sure there are no gaps where gases could escape out the sides before they get to the condenser. And the best way to do that is to keep everything simple and to not try and show all the little places where the flask joins the next bit. So I'm just going to draw a straight line up. I'm only drawing it that far up just to give myself some space. And then what I'm drawing here is the inside tube of the condenser. And then I'm just going to draw the rest of it up there. At the top part, I need to make sure that I am putting some sort of stopper and then I can draw my thermometer, which is just going to be basically a stick with a little bit at the end like that. OK, and uh, if you're as bad at drawing as I am, and you think there's any ambiguity, simply label it thermometer. OK, how do we make this tube that I've drawn look like a condenser 
we can just draw a little jacket around the outside, but we do need to show in most of these diagrams the water going in and the water out. That's an important label for my diagram. It needs to go in at the bottom of the condenser, by which I mean the bit that is closest to the ground, basically the lowest point. So my water is going in there and my water, cold water is coming out at the top. That just keeps the pressure from going around the condenser and is able to sort of keep the water moving so that it's continually cooling down the liquid. OK, so we've got our thermometer, we've got our flask, we've got our condenser, we've got all the main points. We probably should put something you can collect in any vessel you like. So I find the beaker is the easiest one to draw. If you're feeling artistic, you can put some liquid in your beaker and a little drop at the end of your condenser. Not really necessary. What is necessary, though, that's not shown on my diagram is a source of heat. And that can be simply an arrow with the word heat. We don't need to do drawing over the Bunsen burner, especially since we already mentioned Bunsen burners too dangerous to do it. So looking at that diagram, it is definitely not a work of art. It's a bit embarrassing, really, for a video, this one. However, what it is, is it hasn't got any gaps. It means that my gas can go up into the condenser and into the beaker as a liquid without escaping anywhere else. There's nowhere else for it to go so I can follow its path down the condenser. If we need to label it, it might tell us to label things in the question, then maybe we'd want to label the condenser. As we said, I labeled a thermometer just because it's a very bad drawing of a thermometer. Probably don't need to be labeling the flask, but the water in and out and the heat labels are very important. It also might mention something in the question about showing how the boiling is controlled or showing how we make the boiling smooth, something like that, a little clue which tells us we need to draw and label because it's not overly clear our anti bumping granules. And so remember, those are the things that allow that extra surface to form. Those are the things that allow the bubbles to form and be smaller so that the boiling is smoother. I don't know what happened to the word granules there. I'll try and draw over the top of it. OK, so there is our distillation apparatus. Keep it simple and you should be getting full marks for that question. So now let's move on to reflux or as it should probably be called heating under reflux. And this comes up in, as you might have noticed, almost every organic reaction. So it's very similar. It includes a round bottom flask. It includes a condenser. But this time the condenser is vertical, connected directly to the top of the flask. Really important, very common mistake. Notice that there's no thermometer and the condenser is completely open at the top. That's so when we heat the mixture, any liquids that boil are going to travel up into the condenser. And then when they get there, because of the cold water around the condenser, they're going to condense and they're going to fall back into the flask. And so this stops any gases from escaping. We can't just put a lid on something and heat it. If it's going to be boiling, it's going to be producing gas, which is going to be producing a high pressure. So at the very best, our lid isn't going to stay on. And at the worst, our whole container could explode. So we've just kind of mentioned why we use reflux. We do it when we need to heat a mixture that contains anything that's going to turn easily into a gas. So volatile, low boiling point liquids, which includes basically most organic reactions include volatile liquids. So it's stopping our reactants or products from escaping. And again, most organic reactions have high activation energy. It's not enough just to sort of warm them up and hope that something's going to happen. Quite often we need to heat it for 10 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes, or maybe even longer. 
So we can't do that without the condenser because all of our reactants and products would just escape and the whole thing would boil dry. Reflux is also an advantage. So as well as sort of not losing your reactants and products, remember that most of these things are volatile and flammable. So we don't really want them to be escaping the container around our Bunsen burner if we are using a Bunsen. Reflux is also a way of making sure the reaction goes to completion. Again, if it takes a certain amount of time to complete the reaction, we are going to be heating it longer. And oxidation of an alcohol is a key one where they could ask a question about why we're using this method. So we use this if we want to make a carboxylic acid from a primary alcohol instead of the aldehyde. For the aldehyde, we use distillation and the aldehyde immediately left the flask, went into the condenser and was collected. If we want a carboxylic acid, the first stage of oxidation is to make an aldehyde. So when it boils, it's going to go up into the condenser and then it's going to condense, come straight back down, and then it can be oxidized further to make the carboxylic acid. And then finally, let's see how we could draw reflux apparatus. It's even more simple than distillation. So it may only be worth a couple of marks, but it is worth doing. We just need to get our flask, do a tube straight up, and then do our little jacket around. So there's no need to do any fancy curved things around the outside of the condenser. We're gonna stick a line in our flask. We're gonna have heat underneath we're going to have water in at the lowest point and water out at the highest point notice there are no there's no thermometer it's a lot easier there's no stopper in the top so there should be still a nice space from the liquid right to the sky nothing blocking the progress of that and of course as before if we're asked, we could add extra details such as anti-bumping granules or we could label the diagram.